As countries become more concerned about the environment, there has been a widespread adoption of renewable energy generation models across the globe. This has led to a significant increase in demand for storage of renewable energies, which has in turn resulted in the development of multiple green ammonia projects, a market set to grow exponentially in the next decade. Joining me today is Olivier Moussat, CEO of Atome Energy, the first UK public company dedicated to green hydrogen and ammonia production traded on the London Stock Exchange. Olivier, welcome. Let's get into it first. Tell us a little bit about Atome's business model and your strategy. Sure. Uh, morning, first of all. Thank you for having us. Um, so the business model is pretty straightforward. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, we are the first company listed on the London Stock Exchange focused on the production of green hydrogen and green ammonia. Up until today, you have seen a lot of companies like ITM, like CPH, to uh, listed, which were focused on the technology uh, and looking at how you could enable uh, the production of uh, green molecules, but nobody actually producing the green molecules. So our business is to essentially replace um, the hydrocarbon molecules with green, so uh, uh, molecules made from the, from the electrolyzation of uh, water to create green hydrogen and green ammonia through uh, renewable energy. And then the advantage of having green molecules is that you can decarbonize the sectors where electricity is not enough. Um, so we are talking about shipping, um, about fertilizers, uh, possibly even around aviation, that's for a very long term, um, and, and possibly even for road transport and bus. And you mentioned earlier um, of energy storage, where you can actually create hydrogen uh, and then you store it. And at night, when there is no sun to uh, power uh, the grid, you actually uh, run hydrogen through a, uh, a power facility and burn the hydrogen to create electricity. So the view for us is really about creating that molecule and making it available to the market to displace uh, natural gas or oil. Yeah, you were talking there about some of the opportunities to use some of this renewable energy. And we know it's it's definitely something that's taken the market by storm in recent years. What are the market opportunities you're seeing for companies involved in this kind of production, especially as, a, as an investor? How do you see this growing in the next few years? So we are in this stage where maybe about 15 years ago, uh, the solar stage was, or maybe the Tesla's were, where you know that the, uh, the technology is just now getting there, the regulation is finally there, um, and, and you are seeing the transition happening to a new form of energy. Um, so this is really where we are, where you are actually got now going to be able to produce locally uh, molecules that you can use into your energy system. So, uh, but of, of course, it's going to take a bit of time, but if we look and, and if we believe um, the International Energy Agency, IRENA, uh, all, all of these you know, large energy groups, and including what Shell and Exxon say, uh, you're looking about the potential of green hydrogen and green ammonia to displace about 20% of all oil and gas production by 2040, 2050. We're talking about 20 million barrels of oil a day equivalent. Uh, so in today's price of more than $100 a barrel, it gives you an idea that it's not exactly a small pocket change. However, you start. You have to start producing today to help solve that problem. So the companies who are now benefiting uh, the most from uh, from the green industry are the people who are actually able to deliver on the ground. Like it's less and less the technology side, and more and more the people who can produce either the green electrons or the green molecules. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about what's going on in the market currently. Could you tell us a little bit the effect that the conflict in Ukraine has had on the energy market and how does it specifically affect Atomi? Um, so what we've seen, I think there's, first of all, there's the trend, right? And, and the trend has been very clear. From an investment point of view, you have seen essentially capital flowing away from hydrocarbons. So mechanically, it has become more and more expensive to produce hydrocarbons and more and more difficult. Um, and, um, and of course, you've seen the valuation of oil and gas companies suffer as, as an effect. So, but it was all hidden a little bit because of the pandemic. Uh, and if anything, we've seen, you know, getting out of the pandemic and now uh, obviously the demand has accelerated. So we started seeing some pressure, but not, not a huge amount of pressure yet. Uh, but suddenly with the Ukraine uh, and uh, Russia conflict, war, it's difficult to say 
or how you know how we want to look at it, uh, you suddenly realize that it doesn't really take much to upset the entire market. And what we realize is over time, um, the, in Europe, we've been more and more dependent on Russian gas in order to accelerate the energy transition toward renewable energy. But then what happens when the Russian gas is taken away? Similarly, we have to remember that in Russia and Ukraine, these are the, the countries, the two largest producer of fertilizer in the world. So what happens when fertilizer is not available? So we are getting from a, a time where we, we thought we had energy abundance to actually energy scarcity. Um, and as of today, more than 90% uh, of fertilizer are actually derived from hydrocarbons. We also get into a case of possibly you know, food insecurity. Um, so it's all, you know, all of these chickens are coming to roost now. Uh, markets are realizing it, politicians are realizing it, and you've got two options. Right? Either you go back and you uh, invest in oil and gas, but obviously it's going to take more than seven years to get new discoveries online, or you invest in renewable massively to help essentially have, uh, have this transition, accelerate this transition. And it's unfortunate to say that in the past year, we've seen more done towards renewable energy and especially towards renewable hydrogen and ammonia uh, than 26 years of COP uh, or even uh, all of the outrage that uh, Greta Thunberg had been you know, having over the past five years. Yeah, and where are your operations based and has this had any effect on it at all? Uh, so we operate in Paraguay and in Iceland, and the reason we chose these two countries, it's they are both, you know, land, one is landlocked, the other one is an island, which means that they already have to pay a very important premium uh, for hydrocarbons and fertilizer. So naturally, they are a place where um, producing green, green hydrocarbons or green, sorry, green molecules um, would be quite competitive. And these are two places where you, essentially it's the it, it, these are the two greenest countries in the world as far as production of electricity. Uh, in uh, Paraguay, you've got the Itai Pudan, which is the second largest hydroelectric dam in the world. It is, it's been there for about 30 years, produces 14 gigawatt uh, of power. And in Iceland, I think well, everybody heard about Iceland and geothermal and hydro is also one of the greenest countries in the world. However, you know, these countries import you know, billions of uh, oil and gas and fertilizer. And over the past year, what they have seen is that the cost of diesel has tripled and so has the cost of fertilizer. So the way that what we have seen is even though these countries are pretty far away from Russia and Ukraine, the effect on their economy uh, of this sharp increase uh, of uh, oil and gas and fertilizer price has really affected them. So it not only accelerated the political will to uh, essentially be behind our projects and accelerate them. And it's also one of the reasons um, when we announced a couple of weeks ago that we were uh, going to, uh, um, that we were buying our first electrolyzer from CPH2, another UK listed company, to put in Paraguay to accelerate mobility. That was actually a request from the government because they say, you know, we, in our COP26 commitment, in our decarbonization effort, we want to see things moving faster and faster. Um, so, you know, uh, just, I guess, to circle back, you know, how did, you know, the, the, how did this affect our operations on the ground? If anything, it has accelerated um, the need uh, and, and, the, and the importance of the mission. Yeah, and you were mentioning earlier the opportunities in the market and how the industry has, you know, garnered significant traction. Can you give us a bit more further details on your large scale hydrogen and ammonia production projects that you currently have? So um, and I think it's, it's you know, as, as we've uh, disclosed to the market when we listed uh, a few months ago, um, we're looking at uh, you know, over 250 megawatts in Paraguay and uh, nearly 100 megawatts in Iceland in a staged basis as far as producing um, hydrogen and ammonia. So the, um, the intention is to go and to reach final investment decision where the large capital commitments uh, will be signed off uh, by Q3 this year, um, so that we have first hydrogen, first ammonia in, um, in 2024, uh, which would make us one of the, uh, one of the first um, independent company to develop uh, production on the ground uh, and available uh, compared to the competition, which has been looking at, let's say, you know, gigawatt projects, you know, the big Angie, the shells, the totals, um, but they are working on a much longer timeline and, and uh, the advantage that we have being a small company 
obviously well-funded uh, through the AIM listing, is that we can move a lot faster and we can take advantage of the market, market opportunity today um, and where you will see in this decade a, a big disconnect between the supply of green hydrogen and ammonia versus the large, uh, fast-growing demand. Okay, and let's finish it off with Atom Mobility because you announced this as a new division last month and you know you recently updated market on this. Can you give us a little bit more on that? Yeah, so we, again, it's all about us solving the chicken and egg situation. Right? Every, you, when you really talk, whether it's, it's in mobility, it's in shipping, um, you see, uh, you essentially see transport players, you see the government who say, I will invest, I will support the sector, um, but obviously I will not buy a bus, I will not buy a truck, I will not buy a hydrogen car if I don't know for sure that the hydrogen will be there. Um, so, which is our mission, right? It's first on the ground, we make sure that we are able to deliver faster than anybody um, and, and then push uh, the regulation, push uh, the demand side. So now that we have made the order for the electrolyzer, we are essentially uh, doing the entire project, putting it together. Obviously, we're talking about the storage, the fueling station, talking about um, uh, the hydrogen fueled uh, vans and trucks and buses. Um, as well, of course, in Paraguay uh, with the government who has, as I just mentioned earlier, is very keen to see this growing because their subsidy bill towards diesel has increased to over $100 million. So for them, it both makes you know, economical sense and political sense uh, to continue growing uh, the, the green transport sector. And we are certainly taking a lead into this. Well, thank you very much, Olivier, for joining us. That was Olivier Moussa, CEO of Atome Energy, giving us his views and insights into the green hydrogen and ammonia market. For more videos from us here at IGTV, join us on Twitter at IGCom, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.